Man, well, if you are visiting, as was said earlier in the service, fill that Connect card out for us. Take it to the hub. Get your free gift. And we're just so glad that you're with us this morning. But I want to also invite you to come back next week. Like it was Easter Sunday is next week, man, it is going to be a powerful service, a powerful celebration about the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. So bring someone with you, um, a family member, a co-worker, and, and man, we are going to celebrate um, the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. And we are continuing our series next week. I'm going to be talking, we've been in a series called Jesus Is, and here's the thing, Jesus just doesn't appear to us in Matthew. But this book is Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. And so next week we're going to kind of walk through and I'm going to show you how we see Jesus from Genesis through Revelation and is going to be um, a phenomenal um, service and, and can't wait for it. But today as we continue our, our, our series um, on who is Jesus, I want to talk to you today, is he a rebel or is he revolutionary? Is he a rebel or is he a revolutionary? Um, Turn to your neighbor and say, is he a rebel? Now, when you hear that, you might be like, well, no, pastor, come on. We're talking about Jesus. He's not a rebel. Now, I'm not talking about in the eyes of Christians on this side of history. But I'm talking about, you know, the cultural norms when Jesus walked the face of this earth and what he did, what he said, his actions, how would he have been viewed by the people of the day, especially the religious rulers of the day? What would he, how would he have been viewed? Would he have been viewed as a rebel? Well, here's just a few examples of some of the things that Jesus did that really irked um, the, the, the uh, religious rulers that would have been kind of gone against the cultural norms of the day. Well, one, he ate with sinners, he touched lepers, and he healed on the Sabbath. Like, th- those are just three, just to name a few, of the things that Jesus did that really went against the cultural norms and would have caused some people, not everybody, but some people to look at Jesus and say, man, he's a rebel. He, that man is a rebel because you have to understand those things that Jesus said and that he did, they were a big deal. But today, I don't want to talk about any of those three. Today, I want to take you to Matthew chapter 21. And in Matthew chapter 21, uh, we, you know, if you've spent some time um, in church and, and in the Bible, and you might know this story. If not, don't worry. I'll walk you through it. It's, it's where Jesus has this triumphal entry back into Jerusalem. Uh, which we kind of know now as Palm Sunday, but then it would have been the Passover. That's why Jesus was heading back into Jerusalem to celebrate Passover, not just Passover. We know the ultimate reason he was going back to Jerusalem was for the eventual, his eventual crucifixion. But uh, Jerusalem was filled um, with people traveling from all over to celebrate Passover. And as Jesus rode in on a donkey, there was people that lined the roads that, that would put down palm branches and said things like, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Yes, this triumphal entry as Jesus entering into the holy week, what he knew would eventually be his death. Do you want to know what Jesus' first stop was after this? triumphal entry, people praising him and saying Hosanna in the highest. Jesus' first stop as he enters into Jerusalem is the temple. Jesus heads into the temple. And let's read what happens after this joyous celebration, this occasion where, where Jesus is coming in, riding on a donkey, this, this, everybody is praising him, and, and the mood's pretty good. Like, like, you know, everyone's excited. Now, they're all excited because they think something completely different is going to happen. But nonetheless, everyone's in a really good mood. It's a great time. And then we come to Matthew chapter 21, verse 12 to 13. It says, Jesus entered the temple courts and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer. But you are making it a den of robbers. Man, Jesus turned the mood real quick. It goes from this celebration to 
a rebuke. <laughs> now, maybe this surprises you a little bit. Maybe you're like, wow, that really doesn't sound like the Jesus I've read about. Doesn't really sound like the Jesus that I know. Like, like I always hear Jesus as being described as, as this kind man, loving man, man of grace. Man, and this really doesn't, you know, equal the kind of Jesus that I've pictured or that I've even read about in God's word. Yeah, he was, he was angry. He was ticked off. But understand, anger is not a sin. And I don't believe Jesus sinned in his anger either. Well, actually, I know he didn't. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26, it says, in your anger. So oh, Paul is telling us, like, in your anger, you're going to get angry. There's going to be some things that are going to rise up. Like, like everyone has gotten, uh, everyone who has kids has been angry before. <laughs> you have a child, you've been angry before. All right? Now, sometimes, I'll, I'll be first to admit, I have sinned in my anger. I've yelled at my kids. I have kind of gone too far. And, and, uh, and I've had to apologize to my kids. And, and I, I learned early on that uh, I don't want my kids to think that I'm above um, apologizing to them. And so there's been times that I have sinned in my anger. But there's also times that I haven't, that I've been angry and said, hey, listen, this is your consequence because of what you did. I was still angry. The anger isn't the sin. It's our actions that, you know, that we sin. And, and so Jesus is, has this moment of anger. He's upset about what's going on. And I want to give you some context because um, it, to really understand why Jesus is so upset. And so uh, to kind of give you a little bit of background of, you know, I said that all the people were coming to Jerusalem to worship to celebrate the Passover. Well, back in, yesterday I have to go back to, you know, Deuteronomy where God gave Moses the law. And in the law stated there are three festivals that I want you to have annually as celebrations. And so one of those festivals was the Feast of the Tabernacles. That happened in the fall. And then there's the Feast of Weeks. That, that happened in the early summer. And then the third one is, is, is the Passover that people were celebrating. This is what was going on right now. This happened in late spring. And you kind of get this, and you can go back and re read through Deuteronomy chapter 12. And so what would happen is Jesus, or God instructed Moses, um, hey, in this law, what you're to do is to bring a sacrifice from your flock to come to the temple and to offer it before the Lord. So they were to come, bring a, bring a, um, uh, you know, a sheep, a lamb, or if you were poor, you could bring a dove. You can bring those, bring those sacrifices from your flock to the temple to sacrifice. Well, what happened is the religious rulers decided that they saw um, an opportunity to make some money. So what they did was they said, hey, what we'll do is we are going to set up a market so you don't have to bring your sacrifices. You know, because some people were traveling miles and miles. And they said, so we'll make it easier on you. You don't have to bring us uh, an animal from your flock. You can just travel here and you can buy the animal for your sacrifice here. And so on the Mount of Olives, we have a, a, a picture. Um, they set up this market. The Mount of Olives is, you know, kind of way over here. You kind of see the temple um, right here. And, and so they at first set this market up on the Mount of Olives. They could come in, buy their sacrifice, and then um, go and, 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 and have their sacrifice in the temple. Well, what was happening is the people that were not bringing or that were not buying their sacrifices, when they were come and bring their own, all of a sudden the priests were deciding, oh, your sacrifice isn't worthy. So the priests were saying, no, no, the sacrifice that you brought from your flock, it's not good enough. The Bible says, they even used, they even used uh, the Bible to, to do this. They said, well, it's supposed to be, you know, um, a, a pure animal, a, you know, a one-year-old. And you know what, your sacrifice isn't good enough, now you need to go buy one of ours. And so they're ripping people off, doing things that's not the way that God intended it. And so um, then they moved the market from the Mount of Olives into the temple. 
Go ahead and throw that next graphic up of the temple. This is kind of a, 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 a rough, simplest uh, drawing um, of the temple. And you can see uh, you have the women's court, you have the court of the Gentiles, the temple building. Well, this court of the Gentiles was all around the outside. So if you were not a Jewish man or even a Jewish woman, you could not go into the temple. You had to stay in the court of the Gentiles. That's where they set up the market. So they set up this market where they were selling animals, all right? They, they, were, they were selling sheep and lambs. They, they were selling, you know, doves. They had money changers who were exchanging money because they wouldn't even take the Roman drachma. And no, they said, you have to use a Hebrew shekel to buy the animals. So they had money exchangers. And remember, people were coming around from all different countries with all different kinds of money. So they're ripping them off while they're exchanging the money. And then they're ripping them off on what they're selling them. So Jesus walks in and here this court of the Gentiles, it's supposed to be a place where these Gentiles could, the only place that they could worship God, and and they've turned it into this marketplace. Jesus is like, what's going on? This is is not what God's word says. Like, this is not the way things are supposed to be happening. And, And he's furious. And he goes in, the Bible tells us, and he drives everybody out, and he flips the table over. I really want to flip the table over. And he drives everybody out, says, get out. My house is called a house of prayer. It's made in this den of robbers. You're selling animals, ripping people off. And it's not even, they're not even supposed to be buying the animals. They're supposed to be bringing it from their own flock. Not exchanging money and ripping them off every chance you get. Get out of here. This is what Jesus was so upset about. This place that was designated for the Gentiles to worship was turned in. Can you imagine live animals all over the place? You know, the birds banging off the cages and the smell alone, right? Like, it's just, Jesus walks in like, man, this isn't what the temple is supposed to be about. None of this is the way God designed it. So Jesus, in this rebel-like fashion, flips over the tables, drives everybody out. Culture was destroying the ability for the people to worship at that time. So as I've been reading through that story this past week, God kind of dropped this thought into my head this morning, or this past week, and into my heart. He says, what tables need to be turned over in our culture? What tables need to be turned over into our churches across America? What what lies have have we bought into that the world has been selling us? What, What are some tables that we need to flip over? First table I want to talk to you about that we need to flip over is the silence of the church. The silence of the church. The church should be, the church should not be silent on spiritual issues that the world has deemed political. And this is what's happened, is is the world in our culture has taken some spiritual issues, called them political, then told the church, be quiet. You can't talk about that. You can't say anything about that because we've decided that this issue is now political and you cannot talk about it. Make no mistake, church, that killing babies inside of the womb is not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. Life of homosexuality is not a political issue. It's a spiritual issue. Parents being charged because they will not allow their elementary age children to get a sex change is not political. It's spiritual. Schools now, not all schools, but I've read about them, have this closet where elementary age children can come to school, and if little Johnny decides that he wants to be a girl, he can go to school, change into girl clothes at school, and what's been told that's handed down from the state to the administrators down to the teachers telling them, do not tell the parents. Oh, you let the kids, let this eight-year-old come to school as a boy, because that's what his parents left his house, Change into a girl outfit, spend the day at school, and then send him home as a boy, but do not tell the parents. These are not political issues. These are spiritual issues, and it's time for the church to stand up and say something. Amen? Amen. The church has been shamed into being quiet for far too long, telling us to stay out. 
Now, I'm going to make a statement that um, is really controversial in our world, but I believe that it's time for the people of God to speak up. And as your pastor, I need to say this, because here's the thing. I do not believe that we, as Bible-believing Christians, in good conscience, can any more vote for the Democratic Party. We cannot do it. And here's the thing, because I want you to understand what you are voting for. If you vote for the Democratic Party, you are voting for abortion, not just as it is now, but if they have their way, they would want it through every term and stage up to nine months. You'd be voting for the LGBTQ agenda and grooming children in our schools. You'd be voting for racial animosity and child mutilation when it comes to sex changes for children. This is what the Democratic platform is, and as Bible-believing Christians, we cannot be endorsing or voting for this political party. Now hear this, please understand, I am not saying that the Republican Party is the party of Christians. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that they are moral. I'm not saying that they are perfect. Please hear me. But what I am saying is there's no possible way that you can hold the Democratic platform and what they have done and what they want to continue to do against the bad that the Republican has, that the Republicans have done. The moral equivalent is not even close. Okay, please hear me, that, that I'm not saying that there is no perfect candidate, right, unless Jesus is on the ballot. There's no perfect political party, but the Democratic Party has stood on these platforms that go completely against God's word, and it's getting worse and worse as we go. And as your pastor, what I've always encouraged you, as the people of God, what we need to do is vote from a biblical worldview, and we as the church need to be voting for politicians and for parties that will uphold the truth of God's work. It's time for the church to speak up. Now, you might be thinking, well, pastor, what about separation of church and state? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> Here's the thing. Nowhere will you find in our founding documents from our founding fathers anything about separation of church and state. You won't find it anywhere. Actually, the first time that it comes up is actually under the presidency of Thomas Jefferson. And he writes a letter to the Danbury Baptist Convention. And that's the first time that you will see the word, the, that phrase, separation of church and state. But here's the thing. What Thomas Jefferson was writing about, he was actually saying, talking about the separation of church and state, that the state should have no say in the church. Not the church have no say in the state. So we as the people of God cannot be ashamed anymore to stand up on these spiritual issues that the world has tried to deem political and tell the church to be quiet. No, no, it's time for us to stand up and preach the word of God, stand on his word and not be quiet anymore. Because here's the thing, that the Democratic Party has this evil agenda that is taking our country further and further away from God's word. And they're not even hiding it anymore. I don't know how you can stand there with, with a straight face and, and say that sexual, sexually mutilating a child at 10 years old to give them a sex change and call that moral. And then wanting to throw parents in jail that won't go along with it. It's happening in states and counties in our country right now. And it's pure evil. And it's time for the church to, state, to speak up. We, as the people of God, need to be voting against this evil. But not just voting, we need to be taking action, church. Like, first and foremost, we need to be praying. Are you praying for this, you know, we're coming into this election season. Are you praying for our, our politicians? Are you praying for our government? Man, we need to be on our knees praying, first and foremost. But then, we need to put some feet to our faith. Right? So we can stand here and say, oh, all these things go that, that the Democratic Party stands for goes against the word of God. Absolutely. But then what are we going to do? Like we need to, we need to put some feet to our faith. So maybe you could do some things like get involved with organizations like the Willow Network. The Willow Network is our local pregnancy center. does phenomenal, phenomenal things that saving babies that otherwise would be aborted. Parenting classes. Helping single moms and parents that are struggling with simple things like food and formula and diapers. They're a phenomenal organization. And so I would encourage you that, man, you want to get involved, that, that to go and, and get involved and volunteer with, with the Willow Network. You need to vote. And here's the thing. You might look at the ballot and say, oh, I don't like any of these. You not voting 
is inaction. We need to vote, and I believe it's not only our constitutional duty to vote as, as, as citizens, but I believe it's our biblical mandate that, that we need to be a part of this process because your not voting is equivalent to you being silent. Here, I want to give you some statistics. You know, there are 80 million evangelical voters in the United States. 80 million. Only 40 are registered voters. And of the 40 registered voters, 10 million won't vote. Can you imagine if all 80 million registered and voted? We could change the direction of this country. So please don't say my vote doesn't matter. It matters. You can make a difference. Like, we, you need to get out and you need to vote. We're looking at ways that we can, um, you know, move um, and, and, and help and kind of, you know, with this process, I'm looking at, hey, how do we do a voter registration drive and get as many people registered to vote as possible? You need to be getting on your school boards and, and sitting on, on those committees, run for city council. Like, like yes, there, you know, like I talked about, Jesus got angry and he did something. So maybe some of the things that I talked about that are like, yeah, that angers me. Maybe God is also calling you to action, to do something, to step up. It's time that the church speak up and not be silent on these spiritual issues. Amen? Amen. Amen. The second table that I believe that we need to flip over and turn over um, in our culture, and even it's kind of seeping into the church a little bit, is that all roads lead to heaven. All roads lead to heaven. I'm sorry, that is a lie from the pit of hell. They don't all lead to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father except through me. There is but one way to heaven. But our world will want to teach, hey, there's, there's many ways. There's many ways to heaven. All roads do not lead to heaven. And the devil has done a great job deceiving our world, scaring Christians into being silent. It's a cultural no-no now to say to someone, hey, if you're not a believer in Jesus, that if you don't accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're going to spend eternity in hell. Don't you dare say that in public. That's what the world wants you to say. Don't, they want to scare Christians into being quiet because, oh, no, there's, you can serve Buddha and go to hell and Muhammad and go to heaven. You can, no, no. There's one, one way. There's one way to heaven, and that's through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior. And it's time for the church, it's time for Christians to start being filled with some boldness again. Because here's the thing. Remember what Jesus said in John 15, 18. He said this, if the world hates you, keep in mind it hated me first. Think too many times that we're scared of being rejected in this world. Nobody likes being rejected. But Jesus said, remember, if they reject you, they rejected me first. Worship team, you can go ahead and come back. It's time that the people of God stand up. Who are you bringing with you next weekend to Easter? Because they're going to hear a clear message about the gospel of Jesus and that there is one way to heaven and his name is Jesus. And we see Jesus all throughout from Genesis to Revelation. This book, this, the, the Holy Bible, man, this is Jesus' story from cover to cover. And I'm going to show you next, next week what that looks like and how we can have find salvation. Who are you bringing with you next week to Easter? See, Jesus was a rebel in the eyes of culture and they crucified him for it. But was he revolutionary? Was Jesus revolutionary? See, the defi definition of revolutionary is involving or causing a complete or dramatic change. See, did Jesus cause a complete or dramatic change? Because upon Jesus' death and his resurrection, man, the gospel began to be spread like wildfire all throughout Israel. All of a sudden, salvation in Jesus' name was being spread all over. And, and we kind of read, there's just a couple places, because in Acts 8.5, it was spread to Samaria. In Acts 8.40, it was spread to Caesarea, which we talked about last week. Then in Acts 9.19, it was spread to Damascus. And then in Acts 9.32, it was spread to Lydda. 
And just in these four verses and, and four different cities across the land, not even including Paul's missionary journeys, this message about the hope of salvation in Jesus was spread all throughout eventually the Roman world. Make no mistake, Jesus was revolutionary. People are being saved and baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit and speaking in other tongues. Families, villages, towns accepting Jesus as their Lord and Savior. He was revolutionary and he changed the world. But Jesus took action. See, I believe that as Christians, that Jesus is our ultimate example. Amen? Like we are to live our lives to look as much like Jesus as we possibly can. So if Jesus was revolutionary in the way that he lived, I believe so should we. That we need to be revolutionary in our worlds, in your workplaces, in your schools, in your families, in your neighborhoods. Are you revolutionary in, in your circle, in your sphere of influence? Because we are called to action. We are called to be people of faith, unafraid to take a stand for the cause of Christ. Will you join me, church, in breaking the silence and proclaiming the name of Jesus until he returns? Amen. I want you to stand to your feet this morning. We're going to close with a song just, man, declaring about how great our God is because we serve a great God. Amen, church. And it's time for the church to be unafraid of what the world says, unafraid about what our culture has told us, to stop buying into the lies and being shamed into being quiet on spiritual issues. No, no, it's time for the church to stand up and proclaim the name of Jesus until he comes because he's coming back for his church. And there's only one way that we're going with him, and that is through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's sing this song together, and we'll be back to close in a minute.